Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Sarah, and I'm excited to be here on this Tuesday to talk about uh, another book and to have another author interview. This book is um, a mystery. It's set in 1929, so we're at the height of Prohibition. We're right before the... uh, the stock market crash that caused the Great Depression. And this book is by Susanna Culkins. It is called Murder Knocks Twice. And I do have copies to give away of this book. So if you, after listening to the interview, think you might be interested in getting a copy of this book, then just stay tuned to the end of the podcast and you'll find out how to win a copy of Murder Knocks Twice by Susanna Culkins. The synopsis is as follows. Gina Ricci takes on a job as a cigarette girl to earn money for her ailing father and to prove to herself that she can hold her own at Chicago's most most notorious speakeasy, The Third Door. She's enchanted by the harsh, glamorous world she discovers. The sleek socialites sipping bootlegged cocktails, the rowdy ex-servicemen playing poker in a curtained back room, the flirtatious jazz pianist, and the brooding photographer, all overseen by the club's imposing owner, Signora Castellano. Castellazzo, excuse me, but the staff buzzes with whispers about Gina's predecessor, who died under mysterious circumstances, and the photographer, Marty, warns her to be careful. When Marty is brutally murdered, with Gina as the only witness, she's determined to track down his killer. What secrets did Marty capture on his camera, and who would do anything to destroy them? As Gina searches for answers, she's pulled deeper into the shadowy truths hiding behind the third door. So that is the mystery, Murder Knocks Twice. It is so much fun. I really enjoyed this book. I loved the setting. And if you are a regular listen, listener of the podcast, you know I've been talking a lot about the Maisie Dobbs series, which is, it starts right around the same time, the uh, end of the 20s, beginning of the 30s. And while there aren't, uh, there aren't a lot of similarities, except for women in this era, solving mysteries, you know, kind of independent women. Um, I just, I'm fascinated with this time period and I'm fascinated by the differences. So there are some similarities because they both have uh, references to World War One, of course, and the consequences of that war. Um, so many young men were killed. So many people were killed in that war and then how that affected life and culture going forward. But the, of course, the major difference is that um, the United States has prohibition. It's set in Chicago rather than London. And whereas Maisie Dobbs is kind of this proper, formal English woman. Gina is a, a Chicago, um, Chicagoan, is that right? Uh, she's Irish-Italian. It's the 20s, so you got some, you've got some great slang and uh, things that Maisie Dobbs in her proper Englishness would never say. So you get this really interesting look of two women solving mysteries in um, somewhat similar circumstances, but in very different locations uh, in the same time period. So I really found that fascinating. And the book itself is just interesting. It's got some humor. It's got great um, descriptions of the speakeasy and this time period, especially Chicago in this time period where Al Capone is still a major figure. People, uh, he's not. He's a character in the book insofar as he was present in the life of Chicago and everybody knew his name and knew of his supposed activities, etc. So he's kind of a character in the book, but, you know, not doesn't actually make an appearance. And then just the fascination behind the the bootlegged liquor, the the rum runners, etc. I found the whole thing fascinating. But as you know, I was a history major and this was way better than the books I had to read about Chicago in my history classes, where we learned all about the 
insane political machines of Chicago during throughout its storied history. This was a lot more fun to learn about a period of time in Chicago. So again, the book is Murder Knocks Twice. It is by Susanna Calkins. And let's go ahead and get to that interview with Susanna so you can hear more about the book and the series um, from Susanna herself. Hello, Susanna. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I'm excited to have you here to talk about your book, Murder Knocks Twice. Before we get to the book, though, um, I would love for myself and my listeners just to get to know you a little bit. So if you could share a, a bit about yourself. Um, I live just outside Chicago. I grew up in Philadelphia and um, I have a um, couple kids, a couple cats, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, um, I've been enjoying writing for a long time, and I'm a historian by training, so I do uh, like to bring in the history, as I think we'll talk about, um, into my books. Yes, and uh, you, you teach history, is that correct? Um, well, actually, I'm a director of our learning and teaching center at my university, um, but I do teach uh, some classes in history. I, every year I teach a graduate class in the history and philosophy of higher education, which actually, um, when I was working in the archives, I was really interested in uh, the context for Murder Knocks Twice. Uh, so yeah, I teach um, one, cl one graduate class in history a year and some undergrad classes from time to time. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So um, let's mm -hmm. let's talk about that book then. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of Murder Knocks Twice? Oh, yeah. So um, Murder Knocks Twice is set in 1929 Chicago, uh, and it's set in a speakeasy. And um, my protagonist, Gina Ricci, is basically starting her first day on the job as a cigarette seller and a cocktail waitress. And so we enter this world in this on the same day that she does. And and uh, it's a, she, right away she finds that people there know her and she's never known them. She, there's sort of some mysterious questions going on and uh, things are going to ensue <laughs> that kind of get a mystery started. But one of them being that uh, she's filling the position of a, um, of a young woman, Dory, who was um, killed under mysterious circumstances. And so there's a lot of questions right from day one of what she's doing there and what happened to Dory. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of questions and a lot of, um, you know, we, we, we don't talk about that. We, we don't talk about Dory. <laughs> so immediately, you know, something happened. Right away, you know, try to raise some questions. You know, um, this is already a strange new world for her. Gina is not someone who is very wealthy. She's working class. Um, her father is unwell and really can't hold a position. Um, her mother passed away when she was younger. Her brother died in the Great War. And um, so she's she's got to make a living. And the kitchen she had been working at had closed. And so, you know, this position, she was told about this position. So she decided she would try it out. But, you know, this is this is not the kind of place she usually frequents because um, you have to have sort of you have to have money or someone to take you there because it's kind of expensive to go to a speakeasy. And so, um, you know, I wanted her to uh, sort of you know, try to figure out this world in the same way as the reader is kind of like, what is this world? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's one of my favorite parts of the story is just the, the setting is amazing because it is at a really interesting time in history, right before the Great Depression, but we're still in um, Prohibition. And plus it's in Chicago, which has a very uh, let's just say shady past in terms of <laughs> um, politics and crime. Exactly. You know, when I was making a decision about what, where my new series would be set and, you know, when it would be set, I, when I, I'm a transplant, as I mentioned, to Chicago. And, um, you know, when I first got to Chicago, one of the first things, I mean, of course, you come to Chicago and the 20s is still very, very lived history here. I mean, everything's about Al Capone. And I mean, you know, of course, there are things outside of that, but you just hear that right away. And, you know, and, and you know, you, there's sort of this, um, you know, it's it's still around. I mean, even when I talk about um, when I talk about when I was still writing the book and I would talk about, you know, I'm going to be putting out a book in 1929 Chicago. You know, people at book clubs for my other book would say, oh, well, you know, I've got this story. My great grandmother used to cut Al Capone's hair or, you know, or, or they were <laughs> rum runners off of Lake Michigan. I mean, it's amazing to me how lived, um, you know, the prohibition 
culture really still is, or, you know, people have these kind of passed on memories um, about it, which I just found so interesting. Um, very unlike my previous series set in 17th century London, which is a little more distant. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, so the 1920s was such an interesting time period for me in, in a lot of ways. See, I'm not the only one who thought this was an interesting time period. I love when I get to interview people who um, have similar interests to me and I can totally geek out whether I do that actually on the podcast or just in my head where I'm like, a historian. Yeah, I don't get out much. Um, it is time to take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about um, Susanna's in inspiration, excuse me, for this series. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSNC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Susanna Calkins about the first uh, book in her Speak Easy series called Murder Knocks Twice. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. So what was your inspiration then to start this series? Well, you know, I think my inspiration was, you know, I, I really was thinking about, um, you know, 1920s and I, I really always have been interested in sort of the roaring 20s. I mean, I, I like the music and the films from the area. I like the cocktails, <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, this would be kind of fun. Um, the reason I said it in 1929, which was not my original choice. Originally, I thought about 1930, um, the, the, the great uh, stock market crash of October. Um, I originally was set in 1930, but last frenetic year of 1929, that last kind of sparkling year where people don't know <laughs> that there's this crash coming Although there are some indicators, which, you know, regular people don't know, but, you know, other people knew. And I just thought it would be so interesting to set, you know, and of course, 1929 in Chicago history is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which is the other big marker of 1929. And, um, you know, while gangsters aren't a huge part of the book, you know, there is, you can't really get around the gangs being, you know, prohibition era. And, um, you know, so to me, it was just so intriguing to think about, um, how to put a where to put a speakeasy too and and what was going on in 1929 there's so many so much warfare not just between gangs irish gangs and italian gangs and you know serbia i mean there's a lot of gangs um mm -hmm. but like where exactly to place the speakeasy i thought a lot about that because different parts of the city had different things going on um i set side of chicago which is where the university of illinois chicago campus is now um that campus was created in this neighborhood in the 1960s, so it essentially um, disrupted all of the neighborhoods that were there prior, which is, you know, quite terrible, actually, for the community. But for a writer, it's kind of a great thing because I could make my I could realign the streets. I could put my barbershops where I needed them to be. I could put my speakeasy where it needed and I could and nobody's going to say, oh, there wasn't a, you know, a florist shop there or a tea shop or a, you know. so I was able to kind of reconstruct a world um that you know hadn't hadn't been there, you know that i could just kind of make up my own world without people telling me it wasn't really like that um so that's why i picked that area but then the more i studied and i started it, it was interesting because this was actually an area that wasn't controlled by gangs so i thought well this is a good opportunity for whoever's there to have some impact and so that's why i have my senora kind of controlling the area and you know it's kind of a interesting place to set a speakeasy Mm -hmm. And your main character, Gina, is um, interesting in this world because she has an Italian uh, father and an Irish mother, which 
causes her to be kind of not part of either world and part of both worlds um, in terms of that. So what what about Gina do you think will resonate with readers? You know, for me, it was kind of interesting, you know, thinking about Gina. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 I wanted her to kind of come out of a couple different worlds, you know, in this case, specifically more of an Italian and an Irish world, because there was a lot of conflict between um, these these groups um, at the time. And um, and also there was sort of this tradition of the Irish kind of being cops. And there was a lot of, you know, Italians, not to stereotype, but there were a few that were involved in, you know, kind of different kind of out of the law activities. And, um, you know, and, and, and actually where I went to um, school in Philadelphia, there was a lot of these similar kind of, because Philadelphia and Chicago are very similar. And I just remember like, there was sort of these tensions that I was even aware of growing up, even in the 80s tensions between these groups um and i thought this has to be similar and i did some research and this is just it was kind of like this you know and um and i was just really interested um in making her relatable you know like i said i wanted her to be someone who was you know kind of had to work hard had to you know have these kind of jobs to kind of support her family you know and and i I wondered her to sort of wonder what it was like to work in a speakeasy because i wondered that and i thought maybe other people would wonder that too actually work there's not necessarily one way and I thought well you know other people might kind of have questions and she's she's a waitress and you know she's you know selling cigarettes and just felt like you know it's kind of a relatable job and and also I have her kind of dressing wrong when she gets there she thinks she's going to have this nice dress and even the clerk is kind of like oh you have a secretarial position and you know she doesn't even understand she's just not really dressed right Um, So I kind of felt like that's all kind of relatable because that's probably she's kind of like me in that way. I think I would totally be completely wrong in all of it (laughs) and then, you know, have to learn and be taught. I I think I would be as well. I mean, we we definitely have an image from like movies of what it would be like. But in the movies, you always have the dramatic things happen. And here there are dramatic things that happen. But you also get that day to day of, you know, her feet hurt. And um, there's, you know, there's tensions between her and her coworkers, just kind of your normal things that happen in a a job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I was like, how actually do you how hard is it to wear one of these you know, um, trays around your neck. And I was like, oh, it's got to pull at your neck hairs. And like, you know, yeah, and you're, you have to wear these pumps, you know, these high heels and um, short skirts. <laughs> it's like, it's all riding up and falling down. And like, I'm sure yeah. for the inconveniences, at least that's how I would have experienced it. So I thought it might be kind of relatable. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 1929, so you don't have, uh, nylons as we know them you have to you know you have to have garters foundational undergarments like yes yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they didn't have like spanks and things like that keeping you in place either <laughs> no no exactly um what kind of research did you do then for the book so you know i had a lot of fun doing the research for this book and it was kind of different from my first series but I did do, um, I mean, I really did, I read through um, every uh, edition of the of the Daily Tribune, the, the Chicago Tribune, January 1st of 1929 through December 31st. And, you know, that's a really great way to kind of just get headlines and find out what's going on. I looked through the Sears and Roebuck catalog, um, you know, and, and that's just really fun. You know, you could order anything you wanted. I mean, it's basically like Amazon, but Sears and Roebuck, I mean, you could get a house and you could order a um, a study course, or you could get hairbrushes and batteries and wagon wheels, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and so, you know, I did that kind of thing. And, and of course, it was a lot, it's a lot easier in certain ways. There's certain things like YouTube videos that I was able to watch um, that show like, you know, even like advertisements that they'd have in movie theaters run before the, uh, you know, the feature. And they would, there was one that was extremely helpful on how to use the new telephones of 1927. And, you know, because I had wondered, because, you know, from watching movies and things, you always see, um, you know, people like call and connect me. And, and I thought, but then why do they have direct numbers? Because you would see, you know, businesses having a direct number, like were people all able to call directly? And so luckily I found out that, yes, there were, you did not have to always go through a switchboard and call for the operator and put in your number. You could dial. 
Um, but it was very interesting watching people learn how to use the new telephones and the new telephone system that came about in the late 1920s. But so there's all kinds of interesting YouTube videos. I have um, my Gina will become a want to need to learn how to um, do photography. And I had to spend a lot of time researching what kind of cameras, how do you develop film? How could a regular person develop film? Um, what kind of materials would they need um, and make prints? And, you know, luckily, all kinds of YouTube videos about 1920s film, um, which was fine. And of course, I also always joke about this, but I really did do what I call a cocktail research. Um, I found this list of 100 Prohibition era cocktails. Um, and I said, I'm going to try all 100 of them before my book comes out. And <laughs> I got to like number 35. Um, just I thought just I can't drink these <laughs> they're just gross so <laughs> I stopped my I stopped my journey on that but you know I listened to 20s music as I wrote and you know and that kind of I think helped make it kind of a little more bouncier actually than my other books um, a little lighter but I think that's you know so I did that kind of and also I read like books and um secondary historical books and uh, by, written by historians and things like that from the era watch some movies from the 20s um you know just to kind of get a feel for it too um but yeah it's it's it was very it's very fun to do this kind of research <laughs> well i'm just gonna say that it's impressive that she made it to 35 on the cocktail list i mean that is some dedication and some awesome research i'm not sure i would have made it that far myself at any rate we are going to take our second break of the podcast and when we come back we'll have the conclusion to this interview so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with Susanna Calkins about her book, Murder Knocks Twice. Are there any autobiographical elements in the characters or the uh, the story in any way? Um, autobiographical, interesting. I mean, I guess in a way, like, my protagonists always have a little bit of me. <laughs> you know, like I mentioned it. I think some of Gina, I think she's tougher than me. So I think I, I want her to be tougher. Um, but I think there's definitely um, a little bit of like the curiosity and the like the weirdness of it all. A regular person trying to figure out this world. Um, but, you know, as we always sort of joke, people who write mysteries and have amateur sleuths such as Gina. I mean, the reality is like if I'm outside the coffee shop and, and all these police cars come up, I don't come up to the policeman and, and try to find out what's happening inside. And I go the other way. I'm like, the police are here. They can handle it. Um, you know, but of course, when you have an amateur sleuth, they, they get inquisitive in ways that, you know, regular people can't be, <laughs> you know, because otherwise you'd have no story. Um, so she's a little, you know, they're always a little braver. And um, yeah, there are other, other auto, I don't know other autobiographical elements really so much as just um, her sense of um, both confusion and, and like awe of this world. Maybe that's a little bit me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so this is the first in your new series. Um, so how many books do you do you have a plan for the series? Or are you just going to write until you don't have any, until Gina says it's time to stop? <laughs> well, I wish it kind of worked that way, maybe. But second book, which I'm literally working, I have it 
I have my edits for that one. So that one should be coming out in, you know, April or May of 2020. My original plan was to have two on one side of 19 of the crash and then two on the other side. So the first year when they're all reeling from it and starting the depression. But then I started working on book three and I ended up, I, I couldn't, I had to have it right after the crash. So it's like the crash happens at the end of October of 1929. And, and, and basically my third book picks up like two days later in November 1st. Cause I, I was like, I, I, I need to keep going with it. Cause the crash was just so both momentous um, for the people who understood what had happened to them and like still sort of distant for people who weren't directly, who didn't have stocks. Cause you know, not everybody ha- were, was on the stock market. So they didn't, so some people didn't, it didn't impact right away and they didn't quite know. So it's kind of an interesting set of tensions um, that was going on because nobody really knew even right away how, how bad it was going to be in the next couple of years. So I just found that, but some people kind of figured it out. Like there were some people right away who were like, this is bad. This is bad. <laughs> so I just found that mm-hmm. so interesting. Um, like, wa- like there's these numbed people and then these other people are just still like, Oh, we're still in the twenties. We're still having fun. <laughs> and, and those, <laughs> those two beliefs are coming into very stark contrast. And you can tell, I mean, even the newspaper articles and, uh, you know, this is coming out of, you know, writings from the time. But yeah, I hope to continue. I mean, I, I won't do like in a, uh, like 50 books, but I would do, I would like to at least do four if I'm able to. Mm-hmm. And you are, uh, you said you're currently working on the second book. So can you tell us a little bit about what's next for Gina without, you know, giving too much away from either book? So the second book um, is a few months later and, um, you know, she settled in and she's, you know, she's still um, selling cigarettes and drinks. She's not a performer, so she doesn't do that. And that, that won't be her role. Um, she's learned, she's been learning photography. She's getting better at that. Um, she wants to become the photographer but that that still isn't quite happening um she's you know developing a relationship with um one of the characters in the book Rourke um it's you know there's still questions about where this relationship might be or where it's going and right away um in this book there's um a few people are 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 poisoned and um and and one person and then maybe somebody else dies as well um, this happens fairly early on in the book. And there's questions about, you know, is the third door selling bad hooch? Because this is this is a real problem in the 20s is sometimes, you know, you get this bad batch and it can be really serious and people can die. And so there's this question of did someone sell the third door bad hooch? Was this an actual poisoning? And so these are questions that Gina gets drawn into um, pretty quickly into. Um, and, and, and her cousin, Nancy, who is better known as a policewoman because policewomen had no recognition back then not really um and she's kind of pushing the investigation um a little bit more and and bringing um gina into it so you've mentioned your other series a little bit um so far and that's the lucy campion mysteries do you want to talk a little bit more Mm -hmm. about that series my first series uh which has four books in it uh were set in 17th century london um during the time of the plague and the the great fire it's easy to remember because i always say it's uh, 1666, so 666, the devil's year, which is what they would say. And uh, and it features uh, Lucy Campion. Um, in the first book, she is a chambermaid serving in the household of a local magistrate. And then over time, when circumstances change, uh, she ends up becoming a printer's apprentice and a, and a bookseller. Um, and so these capacity allow her to kind of move around the society and um, you know, uh, you know, deaths happen. There's a lot of deaths in 17th century London from plague and all these things, but also, you know, it's easy to disguise murders and look like they're natural causes. Um, so Gina gets brought into several of these, um, issues just by dint of her position. And, uh, I really wanted to set it in the 1660s because it really was a time of unprecedented social you know, for women and for people who without much means like servants, because really, essentially, it sounds hard to say, harsh to say, but so many people had died that, you know, people could sort of um, take on new roles and, and, you know, you know, servants could become masters and nobody would know that they, you know, they would just take over the tools of the trade and, you know, a lot of identity theft and, you know, but also just people filling positions like women, similar to like after World War One and after World War Two. Times women got to do more what were traditionally men's occupations because the men were, you know, fighting or had passed away. Um, it's very similar in 
thick so women are able to like do things so that's why Jean is able to become a printer's apprentice which is very uncommon for a woman at the time so yeah so these are um you know they're all mysteries um is standalone but the characters develop over the course of the four books um but you can read them all separately without you know not being able to follow what's going on when did you start writing um mysteries for for publication is writing something that you've always wanted to do when I was a kid, I was always writing little stories and, you know, writing books. And you could tell even, about, you know, short things from being a kid. Um, you know, you could tell where I was I was influenced. I mean, I had one that I was just writing in a composition notebook for several years. I would just add these, like what I'd been reading. Oh, I guess I was in my Narnia stage or I was in my Alice in Wonderland stage or, you know, because I could sort of like imitate some fan fiction, I guess. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I was always kind of writing stories and, and through high school. But in college, I always feel like, you know, I, 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 even though I, you know, have a PhD now, it's like college just beat the creativity out of me. Um, but it wasn't until I was working on my PhD in history, and I was, um, I was, wor I was working in London for a couple months while I was doing research. I, I worked aboard the Golden Hind, which is a, a museum of a replica of Sir Francis Drake ships that that's dry, uh, dry, dry docked in the. Sailor, a 16th century sailor, so a living history specialist tour guide. Um, and during the week, and then on the weekend, I was a pirate because I did pirate parties for you know little <laughs> British children. <laughs> but it was fun because I, I started. I was I would once a week I would have to stay on the ship doing ship watch um, all by myself. And you know I was on the Thames and I would kind of look out at the mont. It was across the river from the. Um, monument to the great fire and and saint paul's cathedral cathedral which had been rebuilt and i was just always kind of thinking about that time period and then i was working on a uh well a master's project at the time before i was a phd student but it was a uh, i was working on domestic homicide in 17th century london you know gender patterns so i was looking at how women murdered differently <laughs> but what was interesting is i was researching these murder ballads and I came across some just interesting, such fascinating things from these ballads. People would sing about murder as like the news of the day because people weren't literate and they would just, you know, sing the story and, and to pass it on to other people. And I, I was just so intrigued by these murder ballads and they raised so many questions for me. But those questions basically became the first book that I wrote, A Murder at Rosemond's Gate. I, I, the, the questions that were there were so powerful to me it was like i need to resolve there's no right nobody can know the answers to these questions from back then but i thought well i will write a book where i get to answer the questions for myself so then out of the the path that you took to become a published author do you have advice for aspiring authors yeah i mean i think that there's always sort of the basic advice which is um you know keep going um write the book that you want to read and, um, you know, don't try to just follow the trends, but like, what is it that you love and, and really write that book? Because I think that's the only way you can write 300 pages of anything unless you, you know, love this world that you're in, whatever world you're creating for yourself and your characters. You know, I, when I talk to a lot of aspiring writers and people who just can't seem to keep going, and I talk to writers who do keep going, and one day I'm going to write about this more as a motivational thing, I think, but it is interesting. The ones that keep going, it, I mean, some of them are motivated, motivated by like, I have a pending contract or, you know, they say that they motivate themselves by like chocolate or, you know, they get to go on a shopping trip or something. But I think that the real ones find a way to love what they do and they don't hate it. And, you know, and, and I think it sounds so fundamental, but get excited about what you're working on. And, and, and this is the thing about motivation. If you're not excited in that moment, then work on something that I would say is writing adjacent. Like, you know, for me, it might be like research something about that time period. If I don't feel like I can write and I'm like, well, I did wonder what a 17th century bathroom might have looked like a privy. Um, and I, so, you know, I might try to research that a little and then like not to use that in the, you know, the book so much. But, you know, for me, it's like finding pictures or, you know, maybe you spend time looking at actor photos to kind of, audition your character audition people for your characters and i think that can be kind of inspiring like what do these people actually look like or i always say to people like try to just 
you know, interview your characters a little bit, like what motivated your characters when they were five? What were they afraid of when they were 10? Um, what were they ashamed of when they were 18? And like, if you kind of get those kinds of questions, it can trigger a lot of good thinking. And then, um, and then actually that can be kind of help you kind of keep writing. But yeah, I mean, it, it really is, um, you know, it's just persistence and just, you know, maybe there's a time when you have to put the book aside and put it in the corner, you know, put it in the proverbial folder. But um, but you have to just sometimes you just have to keep going. <laughs> and that's, mm-hmm. that's I mean, people say button chair, but that's really what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. And um, when you sounds like you love to read, you love to do research. Um, when you take the time to read for yourself, do you have favorite authors or genres? I have always loved mysteries. I mean, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was always reading Agatha Christie. Um, later on, when I was in grad school, I, I, I found that people write historical mysteries. So Anne Perry and Charles Todd, I, I read these books because my mother had recommended them. And I didn't have a lot of time to read fiction in grad school. But I, that's when I was like, oh, maybe I can do this. Like, oh, maybe. And so, um, you know, so I, I love those books. I, I read across, um, all kinds of genre, but I mean, I love, um, the books by, um, Lori Raider Day, who writes, you know, kind of, um, contemporary, um, domestic kind of suspense. Um, you know, she's a wonderful writer. Um, you know, there's just so many writers now that I've been able to be exposed to that I love. I also really like um, dystopian books and you know, the YA, young adult books as well. Um, so I try to read mm-hmm. outside my genre as well. I know you have a website. So if you can tell us the address of your website and um, any social media you might have that people can find you. My website is www.susannacalkins.com. And I am on Facebook, um, uh, Susanna Calkins. Both I have an author page and a regular friend page. Um, and then on Twitter, I'm S Calkins three. So, and actually, I'm on Instagram now too. I went for a couple of weeks, so I'm still getting used to that. So, honestly, I can't remember my handle for that, but it's. it's I'm sure if you just put in Susanna Calkins, it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. We've talked about the books and we've talked about writing. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like for people to know about um, either either of your series or just anything that we haven't covered? I mean, the, the other reason I set the books um, in, in this era is because we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Volstead Act in October of this year. 20, uh, it was in 1919, October. Um, to me, you know, we're about to engage in this first decade um, of the of the prohibition. and. Um, you know, and of course, now we have such interesting questions around, you know, prohibition around marijuana and, you know, other kinds of um, legal medicines. And, you know, and I think there's a lot of similarities that we're seeing 100 years later, which I just find really interesting. It kind of resonates um, just 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 something that's interesting to me. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be exciting. It's really interesting that um, that. And we're coming, we're coming up on the twenties again. And I, you know, are they going to be the Roaring Twenties? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, they might be a little different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me about the series and the first book, Murder Knocks Twice. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you again to Susanna for taking the time to talk to me not only about Murder Knocks Twice, but about her Lucy Campion series, as well as writing in general. I, as always, greatly appreciate it. And I, as I said before, thought this was such a fun book, such a great setting and really interesting characters. So if you are interested in winning a copy of Murder Knocks Twice by Susanna Culkins, all you have to do is go to uh, social me- our social media pages, GSMC Book Review Podcast, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Comment on this episode, which is episode 168, of course, interview with Susanna Culkins, and you'll be automatically entered to win a copy of Murder Knocks Twice. So Again, that's uh, GSMC Book Review Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Comment on this episode and you'll be entered into that giveaway. So thank you so much to Susanna. Thank you as always to you, my listeners. I greatly appreciate you and your love of reading because 
it's one of my favorite things in the world. So I appreciate anyone else who appreciates it. <laughs> I hope you're having a great week. I hope you continue to have a great week. And I hope that week uh, involves some time for you to go out and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program